Hello everyone, I'm Jack Fisher and welcome to my world. And I freely concede that world is not as exciting as a theme park with real life dinosaurs. Then again, few worlds can ever be that exciting. The list of books, movies, TV shows, and games that can deliver such an experience are as rare as they are precious. And one world that deserves to be at or near the top of that list is Jurassic Park. Now to be clear, I'm not referring to the whole franchise. I'm just referring to that beautiful 1993 movie, the ultimate summer blockbuster that started it all, and the movie that set an impossibly high bar for all the sequels that came after it. Now don't worry, I'm not going to ignore the sequels. But still, let's take a moment to appreciate just how utterly incredible that first movie was. It is, in my humble opinion, the greatest summer blockbuster of all time. Now, in a previous video, I called Terminator 2 Judgment Day the greatest action movie of all time. And I still stand by that. Well, now, I'm saying that Jurassic Park is the greatest pure popcorn movie of all time. Just take everything that makes the general movie-going experience great and take everything you think makes a quality summer blockbuster. Jurassic Park has all of that and then some. There's action, drama, heart, suspense, tension, and even a touch of old school horror. It has a compelling story full of compelling characters, all of whom grow considerably as the plot unfolds. There are also these larger themes that readily apply to the real world. Themes on humanity, hubris, family, and respecting nature. And on top of that, there are a couple of adorable kids. And oh yeah, there's also dinosaurs. Big, roaring, awesome dinosaurs. That certainly helps. Jurassic Park is one of those rare movies that, if it came out in any year, it would still inspire the same awe and wonder. It's also one of those movies that you can see multiple times and still enjoy. It just has so many memorable moments that are worth experiencing again and again. Most people who have seen the movie can recount those moments in vivid detail, right down to the amount of hair on Jeff Goldblum's chest. Now, for anyone who wasn't around in 1993, it's hard to overstate just how big this movie was. Yes, it made a billion dollars at the box office, but keep in mind, a movie making a billion dollars in 1993 means a lot more, and not just because of inflation. The success of that movie became a full-blown craze that year. There were toys, accessories, video games, and action figures. Basically, anything associated with dinosaurs was caught up in the spectacle. Hell, I even remember kids at school trying to roar like raptors. This movie really was that big. After having seen it so many times over the years, I've only come to appreciate it more and more. Then there are the sequels. And this, sadly, is where I have to temper my excitement. Because more than any other franchise, those sequels fail to capture the same energy and spirit of that first movie. Yes, I'm aware Jurassic World made a billion dollars in 2015, and by basically leveraging our nostalgia of the first movie to the utmost. But to those who weren't alive in 1993, trust me, it did not have the same impact as the first. None of the sequels even came close. But why is that? Why is Jurassic Park this cinematic masterpiece, whereas the sequels just never seem to come close? There are many videos on YouTube that attempt to answer that question, but a lot of them just devolve into lamenting how much better movies used to be in the 90s. And honestly, I'd like to avoid that. I'd also like to highlight what makes Jurassic Park the perfect summer blockbuster and how its approach contrasts considerably with the sequels. Because when you take a step back and look at all these movies in their totality, one thing becomes painfully obvious. When a movie is as great as Jurassic Park, the sequels are almost destined to underwhelm, but not for the reasons you might expect. The first few minutes of Jurassic Park don't waste a single frame of film. It's so dark and ominous. We see a bunch of heavily armed men transporting something in a cage. 
something that's clearly very dangerous and volatile. You never actually see what it is. And even if you didn't know this movie was about dinosaurs, the message still comes across. There are some dangerous creatures in this movie and they're willing to attack and kill humans. And even though humans have the tools to fight back, it's just not enough. It sets a clear tone for what kind of story we're about to experience. And it only gets more intense from there. And the sequels, well, they're not nearly as subtle. In fact, subtlety is almost entirely abandoned by the time Jurassic World comes out. Now, some of that is unavoidable. There's no hiding the fact that these movies involve big, dangerous dinosaurs. Trying to surprise people like that is like trying to surprise Star Wars fans about Darth Vader being Luke Skywalker's father. But that lack of subtlety isn't the biggest issue with the sequels. Hell, it's barely in the top five. The reason that first scene is worth highlighting is simple. Jurassic Park presented the premise of its story perfectly. It offers vivid, suspense-laden hints about what this movie involves. Then, it steps away from the action, and it takes time to tell that story. It doesn't drag at any point. Within the first 10 minutes, we meet the main characters and learn about the main conflict. We find out that John Hammond has a problem. He's about to open a revolutionary theme park, but he needs two experts, Dr. Grant and Dr. Sadler, to sign off on it. That'll get his lawyers and investors off his back, and it'll allow him to proceed. It's so simple and streamlined. Even a kid can follow it. There's still plenty of blanks, but that's by design. That's where even more subtlety comes into play. Again, if you didn't know this movie was about dinosaurs, you wouldn't even know what kind of theme park this is. You just know that John Hammond needs some experts to help him. Everything that happens from there just emerges organically. For the sequels, Jurassic Park The Lost World, Jurassic Park 3, and both Jurassic World movies? Well, it's more of a mixed bag, to say the least. Some are messy and hard to follow. The first 10 minutes of The Lost World and Jurassic Park 3 are just so mundane. They're not bad, per se. They're just not at all memorable. There's none of the intensity that we got from that opening scene in the first movie. Now, I'll concede that both Jurassic World movies are a bit better in some respects. They don't waste time establishing what these movies are about. Granted, it's pretty generic. It really doesn't offer anything that new. But at least we know the situation. It may lack tension or suspense, but it's not overly vague. More than anything else, though, Jurassic Park offers an aura of intrigue and suspense. It spends the time and energy to get the audience interested. But the sequels mostly rely on the audience's familiarity with the franchise and mostly cater to those sensibilities, sometimes to an excessive degree. They're never as willing to put in the same time or energy. They're just too eager to get to the dinosaur-fueled action. Now, I love that action as much as the next guy, but spectacle without substance is just fireworks. Any movie can have fireworks. Jurassic Park dared to offer something more from the very beginning. And the sequels just didn't make that same effort. And unfortunately, that lack of effort extended to other aspects of those movies. Jurassic Park is a memorable movie for a lot of reasons. Most who've seen the movie will certainly remember the dinosaurs and the presence they brought to every scene. But those scenes only work because the characters are so endearing. Yes, the T-Rex is a huge presence in the movie, but so are Alan Grant, Ellie Sadler, Ian Malcolm, John Hammond, and especially the kids, Tim and Lex. These characters are all memorable in their own right. And in the same way it perfectly establishes a presence, Jurassic Park puts just as much time and energy into its characters. It establishes early on that Dr. Grant is not fond of kids and that he has some ideas that others in his field find absurd. 
It establishes that Dr. Sadler is very much an equal for Dr. Grant, an expert in her own field, and someone who regularly challenges everyone around her. It establishes that John Hammond isn't just some generic rich guy. He has a vision and a dream that he's trying to realize. His grandkids, Lex and Tim, are part of that dream, and they seem eager to embrace it with him. The movie also reminds us that Jeff Goldblum can make any character he plays more charismatic. Because seriously, who else could have played Ian Malcolm so perfectly? Once again, the character development is subtle. Jurassic Park doesn't attempt to reveal everything about each character. It just offers subtle hints and teases, both through dialogue and through action. And it trusts the audience to make the connections from there. We don't need to be told to like these characters. They make themselves likable through their behavior, or in the case of Dennis Nedry, unlikable to the utmost. In doing so, Jurassic Park raises the stakes considerably when the dinosaur fuel danger emerges. The fact that we grow to like these characters gives dramatic weight to every action. Whether it's them running from the T-Rex or trying to outwit the raptors, these characters aren't just random nobodies. They're individuals that we've come to know on an intimate level. And we end up caring about what happens to them. Now, I won't say the sequels lacked likable characters. I'll even concede that Jurassic World gave us some solid characters like Owen Grady. But I attribute that more to Chris Pratt's inherent likability rather than the substance of the movie itself. Because, for the most part, the sequels never prioritized characters or charisma as much as the first. They were far more focused on just putting a certain group of characters in action-heavy scenes featuring dinosaurs. It didn't really matter how much or how little we cared about these characters. They were just the necessary components for the dino-heavy spectacle. And that's just a recipe for a bland, generic movie. And on top of that, the sequels developed a nasty habit of creating overt villains. In The Lost World, you had Peter Ludlow, a more evil, far less likable version of John Hammond. In Jurassic World, you have Dr. Wu and Vic Hoskins, who want to turn dinosaurs into weapons for profit. And in Jurassic Park 3, you have a couple that's willing to lie and deceive Dr. Alan Grant, a character we already liked from the previous movies. Now, if this were a superhero franchise, then creating outright villains makes sense. But this is not a Marvel movie. This is Jurassic Park, a movie steeped heavily in themes of humanity, hubris, and nature. And those elements just aren't conducive to overly villainous caricatures. The only true quote-unquote villain in Jurassic Park was Dennis Nedry. But he wasn't some evil mastermind. He was just an arrogant computer programmer with financial problems. He basically causes most of the chaos that unfolds throughout that movie. Also, he can steal embryos, get paid, and screw over his employer. Yes, he's an asshole, but he's not a villain on the same level as Hoskins or Ludlow. He's just a very flawed human who ultimately gets what's coming to him in a very fitting, very memorable way. But beyond the villains, the sequels just don't do enough to make the main characters likable. Jurassic World's Claire Deering is basically the antithesis of Ellie Sadler. She's arrogant and self-absorbed. She clashes with everyone around her, making misguided decisions for entirely selfish reasons. Plus, what happens to her assistant, Zara, is just plain tragic. Seriously, that woman didn't deserve to get eaten by a mosasaur. At least when the T-Rex ate the blood-sucking lawyer in Jurassic Park, he'd earn that fate. Because lawyer or no lawyer, how do you leave two scared kids alone in a car with a hungry T-Rex outside? And aside from Owen Grady, what character in the sequels is the least bit memorable? And what do the movies do to make us care about these characters? Even when Simon Masrani, the John Hammond villain for Jurassic World, crashes his helicopter, where's the impact? Where's the dramatic weight? It's just not there. And it's not there because the effort was never there. Jurassic Park succeeded in a lot of things, but how it made us care about these characters is one of its greatest achievements. Doing all of that while also giving us dinosaurs just adds to the overall experience. 
But in addition to the characters, another big part of that experience is the overarching themes and messages of the movie. And this is another area where Jurassic Park did everything right, and the sequels only ever put in the bare minimum effort. It's easy to forget that before Jurassic Park became the ultimate summer blockbuster, it was also a best-selling book by Michael Crichton. That book, which I do recommend by the way, offers a number of critical themes and insights, most of which the movie reflects beautifully. And if it has a main theme, it's this. Tampering with nature is dangerous. Thinking you can control something that cannot be controlled is the very height of arrogance. And if you become too blinded by the possibilities, you'll fail to accept the responsibilities, which could eventually cost lives. Jurassic Park, both the book and the movie, goes out of its way to make this point. It doesn't do so directly. When we first meet John Hammond, he's this eccentric but overall likable guy. You get the sense that he's trying to do something great for the world. He sees what's possible with this technology that he's unlocked, and he seeks to realize those possibilities. He genuinely believes that Jurassic Park will inspire and enchant. Then, in one of the movie's most memorable scenes, Dr. Ian Malcolm perfectly lays out the flaws. He tells John Hammond outright. Um, I'll tell you the problem with the scientific power that you're, that you're using here. Uh, it didn't require any discipline to attain it. You know, you read what others had done, and you, and you took the next step. You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves, so you don't take any responsibility for it. You stood on the shoulders of geniuses uh, to accomplish something as fast as you could, and before you even knew what you had, you, you patented it and packaged it and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now you're selling it. You want to sell it. Well, it's a great scene one that Jeff Goldblum acts to perfection. But Hammond still doesn't see it. He's too blinded by the wonder of his vision. And it's only when his loved ones are in danger that he realizes the folly of his arrogance. It's a powerful message, one that relies on characters growing and realizing just how wrong they were. And from there, they make hard choices to rectify their mistakes. And this overarching theme about tampering with nature and realizing the dangers, it's a perfectly relevant theme, one that's arguably much more applicable today than it was in 1993. As for the sequels, well, the themes aren't nearly as clear. In fact, both The Lost World and Jurassic Park 3 don't even seem to bother with themes. They're presented as generic action movies. In fact, The Lost World basically ignores all the lessons Hammond learned in the first movie which leads to similar results, complete with somebody getting eaten alive. And Jurassic Park 3 is just an elaborate rescue mission, one that does little to expand or reinforce the themes of the first. As for Jurassic World, well, I'm honestly confused by that movie. Because despite the first park ending in such disaster, someone still comes along and builds another, once again ignoring all the hard lessons that John Hammond learned, and again, incurring disastrous results? If the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, then yeah, the Jurassic World sequels were batshit insane. The first movie made it clear that a theme park full of genetically engineered dinosaurs was dangerous, and tampering with nature in general was dangerous. But nobody seems to heed that because, well, that's really never answered. Now, some of that is due to the narrative shift in Jurassic World. Making dinosaurs became less about theme parks and more about unscrupulous billionaires trying to turn dinosaurs into weapons and or pets. And honestly, I think that shift would have been an easier sell if the sequels had just ignored the park concept altogether. The idea of unscrupulous billionaires doing terrible things with these dinosaurs, things far removed from the noble intentions of John Hammond, that could have worked both thematically and cinematically. But sadly, Jurassic World didn't bother making that point. For the most part, it just dumbed the story down to a good guys versus bad guys dynamic, one where humans and dinosaurs had to team up and save the day. Now, it's still not a bad idea for a story. I think that could have definitely worked. 
but the sequels just refused to stray too far from the original, and they were too willing to sacrifice a larger message for better action scenes. And even with respect to that action, the first Jurassic Park still stands out, despite being limited by early 90s movie making technology. In fact, its approach to action is a big part of why it still holds up after so many years. I can still vividly remember the first time I saw the T-Rex while watching Jurassic Park. Even before it appeared on screen, the ominous signs of its presence was apparent. It sent shivers down my spine. I knew it was coming, but it still struck me so hard when I finally saw it. That impact, that feeling we get when we see a scene like that, it's what separates ordinary movies from true cinematic marvels. Jurassic Park crafted every action sequence beautifully. Moreover, it gave every sequence an element of drama, suspense, and purpose. And it did all this without relying too heavily on CGI. Now, that's to be expected for a movie in 1993. CGI technology was nowhere near what it is today. Hell, it had improved immensely by the time the first sequel came out. But by being so careful and diligent with CGI, the first Jurassic Park had to do a lot more to make these scenes count. That means building up a scene with something other than flashy graphics. Something as simple as a cup of water vibrating, or a shadow in the background, that does plenty to add tension before a dinosaur ever shows up on screen. And even in the scenes without dinosaurs, like when Dr. Sadler is turning on the power, which leads to Tim getting shocked by the fence, the suspense is agonizing. We, the audience, know what's coming, but not everyone in the scene knows. It's dramatic irony at its finest. It also helps that there's a sense of heart and humanity behind every action. When Dr. Grant fights to save Lex and Tim from the T-Rex, it's not framed as some guy doing the right thing. We learned earlier that Grant doesn't like kids and he has no inclination to be around kids. Now, suddenly, he's putting his life on the line to save a couple of kids who aren't even his? That really raises the stakes. And they only keep rising as he works to save them. As for the dinosaurs themselves, well, that's the remarkable thing here. They're never framed as monsters or villains or anything of the sort. They're just animals. They're doing what they do, hunting for food and surviving. People just happen to be in their way. It perfectly reflected Steven Spielberg's underlying approach to the movie, which was to not make a monster movie. Instead, he wanted to make a movie about humanity and nature. And in the sequels, there's a distinct lack of depth to every action sequence. There's also a greater reliance on CGI to create a larger spectacle. Granted, some of those spectacles are amazing, the Lost World certainly had its moments, and Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom definitely raised the bar with how grand those spectacles could be. The problem is that those same spectacles, when used in excess, come off as shallow. It's all style and no substance. When Owen Grady tries to save Claire and some kids, there's just no dramatic weight to it. He's not like Alan Grant in that he has an aversion to kids. And with Claire, there's not a sense that she's doing all this for a larger purpose. They're both just acting and reacting. Their decisions throughout Jurassic World feels less like decisions and more like reflexes. Hell, just look at the kiss between Claire and Owen. Was there any depth whatsoever behind it? The Lost World and Jurassic Park 3 had even less depth. Those movies were built almost entirely around action sequences. And it all came down to this. Put humans near dinosaurs, have dinosaurs chase humans, and have humans try to survive. Replace the dinosaurs with any other monster movie and the effect is the same. That's not just generic, it's the complete antithesis of what Spielberg set out to do in the first Jurassic Park. And if your goal is to make a successful sequel, then abandoning one of the core elements of the original shouldn't be part of the process. Because you don't need fancy CGI. You don't need animatronics beyond what was available in 1993. 
You just need to make sure every action sequence has some weight to it. Doesn't have to be much. It just has to get us, the audience, to care about what happens to all those involved. Jurassic Park succeeded. The sequels, not so much. Jurassic Park did a lot for summer blockbusters beyond just raising the bar for quality. It's one of those movies that leaves a lasting legacy, one that is felt by multiple genres. There are moments in that movie that feel like a horror movie. That first scene with the T-Rex is laced with classic horror elements, from suspense to bloody violence to children screaming. But there are also moments containing heavy sci-fi and action thriller elements. The cloning technology, the park security, and all the dramatic action sequences, they all mesh together so perfectly. It's one of those movies that really does have something for everyone. But the sequels just aren't anywhere near as ambitious. They're just action thriller movies, plain and simple. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Compared to other movies in that genre, the Jurassic Park sequels do plenty of things right. Jurassic Park 3 was largely a rescue movie, one that just happened to involve dinosaurs. Jurassic World 2 had some mystery elements to go along with the action. But at the end of the day, the sequels were all about dino-heavy action. Again, that's all well and good. That certainly has plenty of entertainment value. I'll even admit I was entertained by watching those scenes. There just wasn't anything about them that was particularly memorable. Whereas you can watch Jurassic Park a dozen times and still enjoy the experience, none of the sequels have had quite the same rewatch value. And honestly, I have a hard time remembering any scenes from those movies, with the possible exception of Chris Pratt training the raptors. And I honestly don't think I've even sat through the entirety of Jurassic Park 3. Too much of those movies are just built around people running from dinosaurs and dinosaurs chasing people. Yes, that's entertaining on a very shallow level, but that's hardly enough to leave a lasting legacy. They don't redefine or raise the bar for any particular genre. For the most part, they're just generic spectacles. Now, some of that is due to lazy filmmaking, as well as studios looking to cash in on the popularity of the first movie. But to some extent, I think the fact that the first Jurassic Park was so perfect is the larger issue here. It's one thing for a movie to be so good that it inspires a host of sequels. Franchises like Toy Story, Ice Age, and the Fast and Furious movies demonstrate how that can be done and done well. But a movie like Jurassic Park is just so good, so well made, and so iconic that the sequels are just never going to measure up. You cannot recreate that unique cinematic experience that came out at just the right time. If you tried too hard to recapture all those elements, which Jurassic World tried to do from the outset, then you're just going to end up with a movie that feels like a shallow remake. But if you try too hard to do something different, which Jurassic Park 3 tried to do, then you're just going to get a movie that has none of the dramatic weight. In a sense, Jurassic Park doomed its sequels by being as good as it was. Its legacy is so strong, so indelible, that no sequel can ever hope to match it. And whenever the studios try, they can only ever go so far. There's still no excuse for some of the more egregious flaw in the sequels, from how it handles the characters, to how it structured the action, to how it explained why people still think a dinosaur theme park is a good idea after the first movie, it's fair to say that, in addition to not measuring up, the sequels just lacked refinement. I also don't deny that Jurassic Park has some flaws, but they were just so minor compared to the sequels, and they did not take away from the overall impact of the movie in the slightest. It's an impact that still resonates today, and, in the grand scheme of cinematic history, it always will and no subpar sequel can ever change that. Over the course of making this video, I've only come to appreciate Jurassic Park even more. That movie is almost 30 years old, and it's still an incredible cinematic experience. I can watch it today and still feel that impact. There aren't many movies that can do that, and it's unreasonable to expect the sequels to do the same. Now, those movies still have their strengths. I won't go so far as to say they were all terrible. 
but they just never came close to matching the quality of the first. We also can't overlook the impact of studio politics here. Like I said before, Jurassic Park was just so huge when it came out in 1993. There was always going to be a sequel. After all, Hollywood is a business. If there's easy money to be made, even if it means putting out subpar sequels, studios are going to do that. It's just the nature of the business. But even if they could never recapture the magic of the first Jurassic Park, there were still stories worth telling and spectacles worth molding. One thing that does have me hopeful about the future of this franchise is how Jurassic World 2 ended. That movie may have been lackluster in so many ways, but it did do one important thing. It released the dinosaurs into the wild, beyond the boundaries of a theme park or an island. Suddenly, this is now a world where our frail modern ecosystem now has to deal with dinosaurs. How do we adapt to that? Can we adapt to that? I would love to see a sequel that grapples with this issue. On one side, you might have those who want to wipe the dinosaurs out, not out of malice, but out of sincere concern. Our ecology is already fragile. Dinosaurs could just upset it even more. But on the other, you might have those who seek to adapt. Humanity, after all, created these creatures. As such, humanity is responsible for adapting, however painful and destructive that might be. Life, as Ian Malcolm famously put it, finds a way. Both sides would definitely be at odds. Hell, the audience might even be torn. But that's exactly why it's a story worth telling. And hopefully, it does get told at some point. And even if it doesn't, and even if we never get a quality sequel, Jurassic Park is still a special movie. It is the quintessential summer blockbuster by which so many are measured. It wasn't just a successful movie. It was a full-blown phenomenon. For that reason and so many others, it'll always have a special place in the hearts of movie fans. That feeling it still evokes to this day, that's a feeling that'll never go extinct. Thanks for watching, everyone. And thanks for joining me in my world. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. And until next time, take care and stay safe.